it's lovely to see you all here online. Um, I think we'll start. Well, I'll tell you more about myself and maybe Karuna Buddhist Vihara a little bit too, as I get into talking about faith and inspiration. But I think we'll begin as I, uh, here is the tradition here at the Anokampa Bhikkhuni Project to uh, start with meditation. So if you find a comfortable position, position you can be comfortable in for about 30 minutes. <clears throat> Let your spine be straight, but your body also be relaxed. There's tension somewhere, like maybe around your eyes or your jaw. Just invite it to relax, invite those muscles to let go. I like to invite the parts of my body to relax that feels friendlier, much friendlier than oh, that's tight again, <laughs> or um, kind of a demand. And to just bring some warm attention to the area. And let the body know that it's all right. It's all right to be the way you are right now. And it's also all right to relax. And maybe there is some tension in the shoulders. You can really check in on the arms and hands and lower back and belly and legs. And I find it helpful to use my breath too, to let go, especially on the exhalation. And taking a few deeper or longer breaths at the beginning can help to engage the parasympathetic nervous system. I hear a calming effect. And here at the very beginning of the meditation today, I want to invite you to just take a moment or two to reflect on what inspires you. When you think about things that inspire you, you may feel a smile coming to your face, or you may feel your heart warming.
the Buddha encouraged this in meditation. Now we lift up the heart. Even the Buddha himself sought out inspiration. And I'll talk more about that later. But right now, what's What's the state of your own heart, your own mind? And how can it be supported by your mindfulness, your wisdom, your generosity? Because that wise part of the mind helps to support and guide what I think of as my more childlike self or maybe a kind of primitive conditioned aspect of my mind, my personality. And that wise part is the part that it intervenes when there is a reaction to craving and clinging. Reaction to contact. That part reminds us that, that wise part reminds us that this is the way things are. This is impermanent. Not me, not mine. And it can also remind us of what is truly inspiring, uplifting.
So I'll be curious to hear later what came to your mind when I suggested that you think about what inspires you. And first, I'll, I'll say a bit about that for myself and some ways in which um, faith is mm, both defined in Buddhism, I guess, or how it appears and how it's developed. So, I mean, I love to think about the things that inspire me. Uh, many of them are very common in our lives. I, I, I get very inspired when people are kind to each other and, um, and generous. Um, and, and fortunately in monastic life, we experience that daily. <laughs> but, you know, when, when people help each other out, um, it is really beautiful to see. And I'm sure that you've had many experiences like that. Every once in a while, uh, there's, some, there's a person in my life who uh, insists that I see a documentary. So, you know, for bhikkhunis, we don't engage in entertainment, but um, sometimes this person almost sets me down and says, you need to watch this. <laughs> and that was uh, recently, she uh, wanted me to watch The Rescue how many of you have seen it's the documentary on how they were able to rescue the the Thai boys who their ages were 11 to 16 I think and they're on a, a sports team and they and their coach got trapped in a cave in Thailand you might remember it from a few years ago hearing about that um, and, and what it took to rescue them. And the documentary is done by National Geographic and it's, it's really, I think, really well done. And what was so inspiring about it was how people came from all over the world to help. And it was such a difficult problem because this cave was several miles long and they were trapped way back inside with no way of getting out. And um, people who were expert cave divers came and the, the uh, Thai Navy SEALs were involved and lots of people with engineering knowledge and they were pumping water out of this cave because the rains started early. That's how it trapped them and it kept filling up more and they had needed to take water away, block water from getting in. And it just was such an incredible story. And people, you know, who didn't know these boys at all were risking their lives and coming together um, and working together in a way that was incredibly beautiful. And having spent a fair bit of time in Thailand, I I can really appreciate um, the culture, the way that generosity is built in um, and encouraged in Thai culture. And you could really see that. And, and, and of course, it's not just cultural, it's, it's everywhere, it's human. Um, the, the expert divers were, were from, from the UK, uh, two really super, expert, the best cave divers in the world, they're, some, they're the ones who actually um, took the lead, needed to take the lead. And it was beautiful what happened. So it's like, you know, just, just the idea that we can, we can notice the things that are discouraging and there's plenty of that in the world in samsara. And we can, of course, notice the things that are inspiring. And we don't want to block out the things that are uninspiring or discouraging. And, you know, that's not the way the Buddha taught. We want to be present with, understand, take it seriously, know it's there, but then not get pulled down by it. 
because it's just nature. And then the inspiring bits um, can really help us, help us in our practice, in our development, in living a happy life. Um, we have um, a person who showed up this morning, actually, and um, has been coming during this past month because he um, came to build a meditation hut for us, a kuti. How many of you know the word kuti? Yeah, okay, we're on this together, good. <laughs> okay, so yeah, this is a little hermitage monastery here. It's um, 14 and a half acres of redwood forest. And I, I know most of you have seen Aya Chitananda, uh, who also lives here outside uh, giving talks for you and um, it's an incredibly beautiful place and we're just trying to kind of build it up from kind of rustic cabin to a place where more nuns can live and and lay people can come to visit and so uh, this man Eric uh, who's been building things for over 50 years is now retired. He's 70 years old. And he said he would build the Kuti and he has one speed fast. He built this thing in two and a half weeks from every, every bit of it, foundation to roof and finishing the inside. And all we have to do is caulk and paint. And he did it all as a donation not as a donation to Karuna Buddhist Vihara, but as a donation to the Nepal, Nepal Youth Foundation. So he said, the only way he does work nowadays is as a donation. And he asks that um, those he, he builds things for give to this, this foundation in Nepal. And this foundation started because an attorney from San Francisco, well, now this is maybe 40 years ago, took a trip to Nepal and she saw the conditions that children were living in and how often um, children would get sold, particularly daughters, even at a very young age, as young as six sometimes to work somewhere. And a lot of times, of course, we know that work turns out to be in the sex trade at some point. And um, when she saw this situation, she was about to retire. Maybe it's not 40 years, maybe it's 30 years, I don't know. But she, she decided that that was gonna be her, her work after retiring, she dedicated the rest of her life and she's still alive. She's in her mid nineties and she still spends six months a year in Nepal. And she's quite, quite the gal. Let me tell you, she, she's managing this. I mean, this is a really cool organization with almost zero, very little, I guess now they may have one paid staff person, but almost nothing goes to overhead, it goes to the people. And what happens is they're they're addressing the issues of, you know, poverty, um, the need for education, housing, uh, you know, just every aspect of of what these young people need in order to have um, a well supported life. And so Karuna Buddhist Vihara is happy to um, to support that. And I saw a lot of that when I was participating as on the board for Buddhist Global Relief for some years. And the projects that BGR does in uh, trying to um, address chronic hunger and malnutrition are a lot like this project for the Nepal Youth Foundation. You know, a lot of times it's giving families rice in exchange for making sure their daughters stay in school and not sent away somewhere. And, you know, things like that. Those were the projects that I find really inspiring. And so the inspiring, you know, bit about how people 
want to help and do help and um yeah anyway you get it <laughs> so noticing what's inspiring around us is wonderful and then of course you're here you're listening to a dhamma talk so there's something in this dhamma that inspires you or you wouldn't be here and when i was 40 years old my father died suddenly and it really had a huge impact on me we, we really expected him to live into his 90s like all of his relatives did or do and um, that didn't happen and it really caused me to get very serious about the spiritual path and my son who was 20 at the time and halfway through college had the same inclination so he finished school, but during that last two years, he was really looking for spiritual, a spiritual community, and he decided he wanted to become a monk. And he became a monk in the Ajahn Chah tradition, and he actually went to Thailand and lived at Wapanana Chah, and that's where he became a monk. And I was super interested in what he was doing. I had taken the... the um, the path of becoming an interfaith minister. But I was really interested in this monk thing. <laughs> and so, and of course, it's my son. I, you know, you can't go far enough away that I'm not going to track you down and make sure you're okay and <laughs> living with good people and, you know, stuff. So I go out to Thailand with only one purpose in mind and of, you know, staying at the monastery. I stayed for a month the first time and it was so inspiring. It was so inspiring to see these men with such a dedication. And you know, Wapananda Chad is Ajahn Chah's international monastery. So fortunately, um, people spoke English and I could participate and um, you know, just to be able to kind of learn, learn about their lives and learn about the Dhamma and the Vinaya. So I kept coming back to Thailand and that started in 1999 and by 2005 I was in robes. So you can see it was a bit inspiring. <laughs> and, um, and of course there's a, the, the, the Dhamma is so inspiring because it works. Um, you pick up the precepts. Wow, if I knew about the five precepts earlier in my life, I would have saved me so much trouble. <laughs> I would have not been so much trouble to other people either. <laughs> and, you know, to really see people like now as a bhikkhuni and people come super stressed out. I mean, we were, you know, we had parked ourselves in the heart of Silicon Valley. Now we're in the forest, but... Before we were just right there where people could, you know, walk around the block and find us and super stressed out um, people sometimes. And, and then, you know, things as simple as starting to live by the five precepts and, and you just see them become more and more happy, lighter, more at ease, um, sharing their stories of what it means to not flirt with the women at work and be available to your wife. This is what this one man said. He said, I'm available to my wife in a way I never imagined. You know, all these kinds of things that maybe we take for granted or are part of our culture or our conditioning. But if we pick up this new way of, of living, it really has a huge impact. So I find that inspiring. It makes me so happy when people take the precepts. <laughs> it kind of never, never changes it. When I first went into robes, I don't know if you know who Ajahn Pasano is. He was an abbot for a long time in California. And before that at Wapananachat in Thailand. And um, he came to my, um, it was to, in my Anagarika precepts um, ceremony. And he gave the Dhamma talk and he said, whenever 
whenever people um, enter the, the monastic life and ordain at whatever level, it just brings so much joy to him. And, you know, it's, it's like whether we're in lay life or monastic life, um, to see, to be following the Dhamma or to see others following the Dhamma, it's just, it's so inspiring. Uh, this last week, Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, um, I'm going to read it to you. He made a post on Facebook. Um, it said, let us remember that this week marks the anniversary of the first week of the Buddha's teaching, first week of the Buddha's teaching career many centuries ago in the Deer Park near Varanasi, present, dates, present day Sarnath. And today, the wheel still turns. The message, just as relevant as when it was first set in motion by the Blessed One long ago. And then the quotes, at Varanasi, in the Deer Park at Isipatana, this unsurpassed wheel of the Dhamma has been set in motion by the Blessed One, which cannot be stopped by any ascetic or Brahman or Deva or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. Yeah, so um, what that's called is a Sala Puja. And so this week we entered the Reigns residence as I'm as I Ajanda has done in, in Australia. And so we're parked here for um, for the three months, uh, except for a few uh, allowable trips for Sangha business, um, we'll be we'll be here. And to think about the amazing the amazing thing the Buddha did, you know, to to really see what he saw to understand, um, realize Nibbana, to recognize how the path unfolds and what it is that it involves. It's the whole life. It's our whole life. It's every aspect of our life, not just as monastics, but as lay people too. So while I was a lay person following the Dhamma, I did some monastic-ish things, like I pared down my wardrobe to two outfits and I just switched them off day. <laughs> I thought at work, are they going to think I'm like super weird? <laughs> maybe, well, maybe nobody gave, nobody cared. You know, I was in um, computer science and engineering. I mean, who's paying attention? <laughs> Something like that. Anyway, they were um, these kind of, kind of a dress that would be wide enough that I could sit in meditation easily with this full skirt and I could um, wear a, a long sleeve t-shirt underneath or a short sleeve one and just deal with the weather or the changes and, and stuff like that. And anyway, just the practice of it, the practice of a kind of lay renunciation, um, I found really helpful. And you can tell I was really inspired, you know, to, to try this stuff and, um, and I recommend it. Uh, of course, you might have a really strange turn of events in your life. As you can tell, this kind of leads to something eventually, <laughs> maybe um, like becoming a monastic yourself, perhaps um, this life or some other life. But this is how it is when we're inspired. And, um, you know, the, the taking in of the beauty and the power of the Dhamma and what the Buddha did in teaching for those 45 years, really giving us an incredible foundation to work with. Um, the fact that we have all these, these uh, teachings of his, the whole set of Nikayas in the Pali, in the, in the Pali tradition. And, you know, just to, to, to recognize that we have this incredible treasure. Um, and studying it, the more I read the suttas, uh, the more 
in awe, I feel, of the Buddha and the Dhamma. And the more one can see how it's a complete system, how it it all fits together. And, and to nowadays with the kind of comparative scholarship that Bhante Analyo and um, Ajahn Brahmali and Ajahn Bhante Sujato and others are doing, you know, you can really see how well preserved it's been. And I find that very inspiring. So when it comes to, oh, I mentioned during the meditation that the Buddha also sought inspiration. I was thinking of a sutta. I think it's probably in the Bojanga Samyutta, the Samyutta Nikaya, where the Buddha is sick. You know, I find that inspiring, by the way. The Buddha, our teacher, he wasn't some superhuman, you know, I mean, he was superhuman in certain ways, like the way the things he realized and his ability to you know, meditate and, and see the truth, but he got sick, you know, he had back pain sometimes, and his normal human body, and he didn't try to, like, make that, like, it's something different, um, because he was this incredible practitioner, but when he was sick once, he asked to the the monk who was uh, looking after him to talk about the seven factors of enlightenment, to tell him about it. And while he was telling him about it, the Buddha himself felt so inspired that his illness left him. Yeah. And this same thing happened to other um, Arahant monks. I think it was, I think it was Venerable Kasapa also had that you know and and this is why when people are ill we chant the bojanga sutta bojanga is the means enlightenment factor so the seven enlightenment factors and and how and i mean you know you may have had this kind of experience like have you ever had like a, kind of a flu or a cold or something and then you're maybe you're kind of getting toward the end of it but you're kind of like dragged down and then something comes along and you feel inspired and it kind of like you throw it off the rest of it you can kind of throw off um and and come out of come out of that and so i think in a little way we can we can understand how that can work how inspiration actually has an effect on our health and um and that you know to me it's kind of fascinating a fully enlightened buddha I mean, he knows everything, and still he's inspired by the words of another person about the Dhamma. This kind of shows how important it is that we share the Dhamma with each other and that we inspire one another with it. You know, even if, you know, you may think this friend of yours really is way more advanced than you are. Uh, don't don't think that you couldn't inspire them further. You know, this is something we can offer each other. And of course, inspiration and faith are obviously very closely connected, but I, I want to say that faith is very different in Buddhism than it is in many other worlds religions um, because this isn't buddhism isn't a faith-based religion sometimes looking at theistic religions we might say they're faith-based i certainly was raised in a faith-based kind of religion it's pretty fundamentalist christian environment in the midwest in indiana america and um you know the idea of Having faith in God or faith in Jesus was something that um, was, of course, revered and 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 um, expected, I guess, in a way. But 
it was so much of it was blind faith, not faith based on experience necessarily. It was, it was um, admirable, admirable to be able to just decide to have faith. Like you're just going to decide that you trust this. And that's not how it is in Buddhism. You know, the Buddha said, you need to experience, have direct experience of the Dhamma. And until you do have direct experience, you can take things on a provisional basis, you know, like, okay, I, the Buddha reported, because see, the Buddha reported his experience. He didn't make up a philosophy. He didn't, you know, this is not something that he was told by a heavenly being or something. This is something that he saw and experienced directly. So this idea of direct experience, the Dhamma is, you know, available here and now and must be experienced directly by the wise individually. This is a whole different kind of approach to spiritual life than believing in, you know, the many, many, many different kinds of things human beings have believed in, you know. Um, and so this, of course, as I'm sure you're aware, is something that people find very attractive about Buddhism, that you're not asked to take something on blind faith. And, and yet faith does play an important part in our development on the path. It really is essential. But we might not even, if we're, if we're really um, kind of conditioned to see faith as something that you blindly accept. And I want to be clear here that I'm not trying to put down um, faith-based religions. It's a different process. And I have a lot of friends and family members who have very strong beliefs. And it's not like they don't get some kind of experience from it. They do. But it's a different approach than what we have in Buddhism. And it also seems completely plausible to me, based on the Buddha's um, description of how things work, that my friends and family members who have a strong belief in Jesus and God and, and, and heaven, um, and they want to go there, that they probably will, as long as they're leading a good life. And the Buddha talks about this in the suttas. There's a sutta in the middle length discourses, where the Buddha talks about how if you're keeping the you know, precepts, you're living a good moral life. If you have, if you set your sights on wanting to be reborn in a particular heaven realm, then it's very likely you will be. Rebirth according to your aspiration. So I, I feel like when I look at faith-based religions, that's exactly what they're doing. And there's, there are branches of Buddhism that are really doing the same thing, pure land Buddhism, you know, and but if we look at the early teachings of the Buddha, what he's saying is practice to directly experience the Dhamma. Practice to directly experience what Buddha means, awakened mind. Practice to directly experience um, people who have developed on the path and reached some level of awakening. Uh, practice to know this yourself. And that's how you build faith. So I, when I was going to the monastery back then and, and spending time with my son and his brother monks, um, I was learning little by little and I was trying all it out, all of it out in my practice. And I was developing, I, I, the way I think of it is my faith developed brick by brick. You know, yes, not killing tiny little beings, being careful of their 
their lives changed something in my heart. Look at that. I never thought about that. You know, I didn't know that's how it would work. And that's just, you know, one example. But we we can we can we learn this as we go along. And so then a lot of people would rather translate the word sadha, which is faith, as confidence, because you gradually build the confidence in the Dhamma. And I strongly recommend spending time with uh, Arahants if you like, you know. I, I go to Thailand when I can to spend time with monks that I know are, or nuns who are, you know, very advanced in their practice. And the more of that we do, the more kind of rubs off on us. And also reading the suttas. I mean, we're really hearing the Buddha's words there and the descriptions of what it's like to be an arahant. And there's another sutta in the middle length discourses where the Buddha talks about, you know, if someone says that they've realized Nibbana, I don't remember how he puts it, you know, like they're free from the taints. Um, he said, don't, don't immediate, don't, don't agree or disagree or, you know, without saying anything about it, here's, a question you should ask them and then and and this is how they would naturally answer if they actually are an arahant and he goes through about i think it's six different questions like that and you can you can gather the the understanding of you know what the way an arahant sees and experiences the world um from this kind of study just to really really take that in what what is it like to completely not identify with all of these conditioned things in our experience anyway faith so we we gradually develop our faith our confidence and you probably know that the first level of awakening, stream entry, um, when the, the, the results, the fruits, are an unshakable total confidence in the Buddha, that the Buddha was enlightened, uh, all those qualities that you know, we often chant about the Buddha. That those, that those are really, that's really true. And you know it, you know it in yourself. And the same with the Dhamma and the enlightened Sangha. Stream enters, once returners, non-returners, arahants. And to, to recognize, to, to have that unshakable faith can't come from just deciding you're going to believe something. The unshakableness of it is a direct experience that we really know. How do you know stream entry is that, that glimpse of nibbana that one gets oneself? That makes it clear. And so that's the kind of faith you have in Buddhism, at least in, you know, and if we look at the early teachings. That's the kind of faith that the Buddha was encouraging. Now, what happens if you don't have it? You know, a lot of people come and clearly they're interested because they wouldn't show up asking these questions if they weren't. <laughs> you know, if they're, um, and so that's good. Being questioning is good. And, and, um, wanting to understand and wanting to be free from suffering this is where we have, this is where we start but then the the buddha has these various um teachings where he talks about kind of a sequence of things that unfold 
And sometimes he starts with faith. You might be familiar with um, the transcendental uh, dependent origination. Um, Bhikkhu Bodhi wrote about it. You can look it up and find. And it's the Upanita Sutta. Is that right? You know? Anyway, it's, I've, it's in the Sanyuta Nikaya, I think. Um, Upanisa, maybe. Sutta, something like that. Um, the, the Buddha said you start with a faith, but it's faith in you already get a sense that there's a way out of suffering. So I, I know another bhikkhuni, you might, I think you know her, I think she's taught for you, um, Aya Ananda Bodhi. And she, I, I lived with her for some years and, and she talked about when she was a young person, when she, she's, her teenage years had a lot of suffering. Um, and she said she, she read about the Four Noble Truths and it just hit her. So it was like, oh, yes, first of all, yes, there's suffering. <laughs> Let's acknowledge that. <laughs> and then the first glimpse that there's a way out. There's a way out of this suffering. And that's the step that takes us out of that loop of dependent origination. And when once we take that step out, then there's a whole sequence of things, you know, certain joy arises from that knowledge. And from that joy, energy, tranquility, there are different ways that this chain unfolds, but then, PT and Sukha and, you know, Samadhi and then the knowledge and wisdom of, of, you know, things as they are and so forth. But the beginning is faith. Now in other places, the beginning of that sequence is virtue. So we can start, even if we're, we, we're not yet seeing something that really brings up our faith, we can just start by cleaning up our lives. That's a choice any of us can make. It's harder in some contexts than others, that's for sure. But to be able to choose to keep those basic precepts that's, that can be the beginning. The beginning that takes us naturally all the way to full awakening. So I think I wanna pause there and hear what you might wanna say or any questions you might have. And I think you can also write them in the chat if you want to. So that's correct. It can be written in the chat if you have a question or comment, or you can raise your virtual hand with the raise hand button at the bottom of the page, or you can try waving at the screen and I'll see if I can see you. I might start off with the first question, if I may. Sure, uh, Derek. When you have visited people who you believe or have heard are highly attained people in Thailand or elsewhere, apart from their qualities such as um, their obvious kindness and peace, 
what is it that has inspired you or given you the confidence that these people have attained something that is to be desired and also practiced for? Yeah, thank you for that. I mean, one of the things that has really inspired me about some of the teachers, well, many, um, but especially those who are very advanced in the practice is their incredible generosity to be available to people, to be constantly serving. Um, you know, I mean, there are stories about Ajahn Chah being sick with malaria and a monk tells him that someone has come to see him and he, he puts on his robe and he goes out and he's talking with them as if nothing's wrong. And as soon as they leave, he's back in the kuti with a raging fever. And, you know, just that kind of commitment, that kind of generosity, that kind of willingness to share the Dhamma. I mean, some of the monks in Thailand um, staying at, at Wat Panana Chat one time when um, this monk named Ajahn Tui was coming. Um, you know, Ajahn Tui, Ajahn Mabua, Ajahn Panyawaro, Ajahn um, Lian and Ajahn um, Liam and Ajahn, you know, it goes on. <laughs> There's so many amazing and have been so many amazing monastics. And where Ajahn Gunha, Ajahn Gunha is the, the one that we've been visiting more lately. I mean, he's incredibly supportive of bhikkhunis. He's, he's, um, he's Ajahn Chah's nephew. He's, he's um, been trained with Ajahn Chah. And there is something in his presence. It's an incredible generosity the meta is just palpable and his just i mean he's getting older now and he's still just doing so much good for so many people you know whether it's the he did so much for the schools in the area in terms of encouraging people to get involved and and offer to help and hospitals and you know just the way he teaches people with so much just complete joy and and generosity it's it's really really beautiful and then of course the fact that his words go right to the heart and i have to say he tells me about things there's no way he could know um without reading my mind or even things i hadn't thought of in years you know, and, and he has, so he can direct, um, they, these masters can direct us in ways that are pretty incredible. So those are some of the things that I notice. And it's not like I personally would know, you know, I'm not claiming any kind of like special knowledge, but it's partly because I've heard about them for a long time and many people I really respect recognize their advanced state of, of um, development. And um, then when you listen to them and some of the things that they describe, you can really get that sense. Yeah. Thank you very much. And the next question is from Minori. Um, uh, thank you, Aya, for that very inspiring talk. And um, when you said, uh, what inspires you? Um, uh, one thing that came to my mind was um, uh, all, the, all those nuns long ago and up to now and you know how much they have have done in these terigatas and so on and uh, uh, so that is hugely inspiring when you see how much people have gone to you know attain something and for me personally I always get inspired by 
the people around me. I, I came from Sri Lanka, so I've got this Buddhist background. I was kind of my parents are Buddhist, but only only a couple of years ago, like, you know, I kind of started actually, what is this? And started, uh, you know, getting into it and sitting and doing meditation. Um, and but then I kind of get so inspired of this community and they're not like me. They, they had to go and search and it was not available like me. I, I could switch on to um, a Sri Lankan Sinhalese channels where 24 seven there are Dhamma talks, but they have to go and search and some people have only this and, and the commitment. So that is so inspiring. And whenever I get a chance, I quickly ask, so what do you do? Like, how did you, how did you get? And it's, mm -hmm. you know, the whole community is, is, is such inspiring place. Thank you. Yeah. It is not a question. It's like the comment that I had. And then one more thing. Um, in this morning, I heard about that um, cave, the boys who got stuck in the cave. And it is another inspiring um, uh, talk. The, the, the coach that were with the boys, I think he was, um, he was a monk, temporary monk, you know, the, in mm -hmm. Thailand, people can be a monk for four months yep. or three months and learn all the calming things. And he was, he was um, getting the boys to meditate and it kind of calms them down and less oxygen consumption. And people thought that when they came out, they'll be, they'll be scarred mentally, but then they will calm down. And I think one or a couple of them became um, temporary monks after that as well, because they were so inspired by the meditation that they learned inside the caves. Thank you. Yes. yes, thank you, Manori. That's true. It's they mention it, they talk about it in the movie, the the British divers who first discovered them after this grueling kind of dive through the cave, um, said, you know, not a tear, not a trembling lip. These boys were apparent seemed not even concerned about their situation. And, you know, one thing is their village boys, which Aja Mahabua mentioned, you could really tell the difference between the village kids and the city kids. The village kids were much more calm and content and the city kids are running all over the place, you know, and, 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 you know, we all have our conditioning to deal with, but the conditioning of a village child is different. Uh, than most of us had experienced. And, and there's, that's part of it. But they also mentioned that the coach was encouraging them to watch their breath, to conserve their energy, and to, and as you said, to meditate. And um, it's really amazing and very inspiring. And, um, and yes, the, the, the practice of taking the robes on temporarily um, I've seen it in Thailand. So, you know, like you're in a taxi and the taxi driver says, I was a monk for this amount of time. And you can, they light up, you know, you can tell this has had a really important impact on their life. And uh, I was at an ordination where there were, oh, maybe I think 80 some men ordaining and most of them temporarily. And the ordination was beautiful. They had their parents were with them. And a lot of times these young men uh, ordain because they're um, wanting to make merit for their parents. And the parents want them to do it. But the, 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 the monk abbot of the monastery was guiding the parents and their son through a process of forgiveness with each other. I mean, there were tears, there were hugs, there were, it was just the most precious kind of like, you know, to observe that was just so beautiful, so inspiring. And of course, um, I agree with you. I'm very inspired by the, the bhikkhunis of old and the, you know, it's like, this is, 
I wish I wish in Thailand that the same thing would be happening for the girls, for the women, of course, and and it is more and more, which is very inspiring. And um, you know the whole uh, the whole thing about being from Sri Lanka. I mean, uh, I, we were able to Ayachitananda and I were able to go to Sri Lanka and to see the faith that people have. Um, you know, go to these holy sites like Anuradha Pura, Pura and, uh, you know, to see many, many people coming there uh, with, with teachers that are teaching them here and there and everywhere around the big stupas and, you know, to, to really witness uh, so much faith. And the Sri Lankan people who come to our place to, you know, it's like so beautiful. Our president of our our, our um, board of directors is Sri Lankan, and he was a childhood friend of my son. I've known him since he's 13. And um, it's just lovely to have that, that background. And as you say, if we didn't grow up in that background, then we have to find it. And that also lends a certain gravitas to it, you know, because it takes some effort and probably some karma. <laughs> And, um, and all of us are making the karma now for the next round. If there's another round, we want it to be a good one. <laughs> and so so um, here we are going forward. Thank you for your sharing. There is a question in the chat from James who can't turn his video on today. I'm surprised to find how my faith changes. Sometimes it is weak and I feel it's fading away. Sometimes it's strong and joyful and I wonder how I could have it. doubt. Do you have any comments about this? I assume it becomes stronger and more constant as we travel the path. Oh, thank you for your question, James. And um, I have seen you before, so I know what you look like, even though you can't turn your video on. <laughs> I'll imagine you there. Um, this is true for all of us. You know, even people who have been in monastic life for many years will go through a very dry period sometimes. And it's really karmic. I think, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that anything can come to the surface. So what we want to do is have some, some methods, uh, tools to rely on and um, tools and spiritual friends. I think these, this is one of the reasons that having spiritual community and spiritual friends is so important uh, because we can all get to those patches. I mean, of course, after a certain level, there's no like going below a certain, you know, kind of strata, you <laughs> might say. But, um, but still there are some maybe smaller ups and downs. And when we turn our attention to the things that are wholesome, inspiring, um, you know, sometimes we even have to ask ourselves, what do I really know? I mean, this was something that was valuable to me early on in the path. You know, instead of all the possible things we can kind of make up or just take on blind faith or imagine to come back to what do I actually know? What is solid? And when we do that, even if it's only a few things, even if it's only one thing, it's still solid and not kind of uh, uncertain. And if we feel like I can't find a solid thing that I know, then we need to go reach out to people who are well-established in the Dhamma. You know, the teachers, Ajahn Pasano has been like a rock for me. Um, I went to him in probably 2002 or three and asked if he would be my teacher. And he immediately said yes. And he gave me the precepts, the refuges and precepts. And I took dependence on him. This is not something that 
lay people, I mean, Ajahn Pasano would do that with lay people. And it made a huge difference in my practice. And over the years, um, I just keep coming back to him from time to time, him and Bhikkhu Bodhi, and, you know, like establish a relationship with a teacher, um, taking dependence on a teacher, even if it isn't like a formality the way it is in, in um, with that, the way I did it with Ajahn Pasano and the way we do it in monastic life. But even if it's not a formal way to really ask for that connection and make it a kind of official that, you know, you can go to them and they um, are there for you. I'm both Ajahn Pasano and Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi really took it serious, take it seriously. When I ask if I can talk to them, they, they are there. And, you know, it's like, that's what we need to do. Reach out, get support. Because the Dhamma is there, it's solid. It's only our kind of losing track or losing touch. That's the problem. So this is, this is really good to remember. The Dhamma doesn't change. And one of the things that's so beautiful about reading the Buddha's words his teachings is that he never alters the Dhamma. You know, the story never changes. He might say it differently depending on who's in front of him because of the way they need to hear it and understand, but he doesn't, he doesn't soft sell. He doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't pull any punches. He's just like, this is the Dhamma, <laughs> you know? So this way we can, we can really get to understand what that is. As there are no more questions, and as we're reaching the final moments of the meeting for today, thank you so much, Aya Santusika, for being here with us and for inspiring us, because I realised, having listened to you, that I needed inspiration today, and you provided that. <laughs> so thank you. You're very welcome. And I would also like to thank everybody else for being here, because a meeting is only possible with more people and it's really great to have everybody there listening and participating and it's great to have you every week and that too is inspiring for me so thank you for inspiring me to continue to host these meetings on a weekly basis and i and i also want to say how inspiring it is that aya chanda is is leading this project and um she's a dear bikuni sister and we're so happy she's having retreat time and can come back to you with uh, with a renewed energy and and um, and inspiration. Yeah, definitely, and it's very inspiring what's happening at Karuna Buddhist Vihara, and it's very inspiring what's happening at Anukampu Project. So for the Bikuni Sangha, it's just a very inspiring time, I feel. And if you would like to see more about Karuna Buddhist Vihara, then you can visit their website. It's karunabv.org. And I would encourage you to have a look at the newsletter because it's really inspiring to see the building works going on there. And also, if you'd like to continue to support Anukampa Bikuni Project, then you can do so via anukampaproject.org forward slash donate. So thank you very much again, Aya Santusika, and I look forward to seeing you again next month. You're welcome. I look forward to seeing all of you too. <laughs>